Okay, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I am Kelsey Woodworth, the Content Marketing Manager here at GiveSmart. And these circumstances, you know, today are difficult for sure, um, but I really hope that what we discuss today will ease some of the online insecurities that we have been hearing about from a lot of our customers and uh, nonprofits alike. So um, these, yeah, again, these insecurities that you might be experiencing, we hope to address today. And, and we have two lovely speakers. The first uh, is my colleague, Megan Mungal who has served hundreds of fundraising um, events and campaigns in her own right here at GiveSmart. And she also sits on the Associate Committee of Hearts of Gold, a nonprofit in New York City that helps women and children transition out of shelters and in, into homes. And um, we're also lucky enough to have Emily Halpern of Giving Tree Associates, a Chicago-based nonprofit consulting firm. Uh, Emily brings expertise in strategic communications, design thinking, and campaign management. And she is passionate about supporting her clients telling the story of, of their impact and developing sustainable giving giving, strategy, giving strategies. Whew. Okay, so ladies, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us, we're so excited. Cool, um, so just a couple housekeeping bits we anticipate going around 35 minutes today, and I've asked Megan and Emily both to stay on for another 15 so we could do some Q&A. Um, so as you have questions that pop up throughout the, the discussion today, go ahead and submit them uh, through the chat and we'll address them at the end. And we also will be recording this today. So we'll send out a link to everybody this evening. Um, and finally, if you feel so inclined, you can join in um, with us live tweeting today using the hashtag GiveSmartPowerUp. So to kick things off, we are gonna launch a, a quick little poll just to kind of get a feel for where everybody is. So currently, you are giving donors a break, contacting donors constantly, doing personal touches, or you don't have a strategy, it's random. So while everyone weighs in on the poll, Emily, uh, could you just give us a quick high level of, of your role as a consultant at Giving Tree? Yeah, of course. So much of my work as a consultant is to work with nonprofit organizations really in a coaching and training role on all things fundraising, whether that's an annual gala event or a large scale capital campaign and kind of everything in between. And I work mostly with small to mid-sized organizations and try to make sure that they have the tools they need to create a sustainable fundraising plan to be able to work with their board in an effective way and to really engage their donors in continuous giving to make sure mm -hmm. that they have the funds that they need to do what they do best. So my cool. goal obviously is to make sure that they're successful long after I'm gone and out of the picture. Nice. Um, setting them up for success is always great. Uh, cool. Let's see these poll results. Okay, so it looks like 9% are giving donors a break, 16 are contacting and mass, 51% of you are doing personal touches, okay, and 24% um, aren't really sure quite what their strategy is. So, um, Megan, what, what do you make of this? I think the personal touches, I'm really not surprised to see that that's the most that everyone said. Uh, I think right now it's really special to have those personal touches. Um, with all of us being in quarantine, staying at home, it's really nice to make that connection, especially with your donors, your volunteers, mm -hmm. um, or even new people you're trying to bring into your organization. So it's really awesome to see that. And I feel like we have a few things later in the webinar that we'll touch on that as well. Yeah, agreed. Okay, cool. So we can close the poll and just run through. So our agenda for today, um, four quick sections of engagement throughout the entire year, best practices when it comes to calling, texting, and emailing your donors, uh, how to creatively stand out, whether it's your organization or current campaign, um, and how to balance your communications among your different donor groups. And so engagement all year round is something to keep in mind throughout today's discussion. Um, all of the topics that we touch on today can be done at any point within the year, so not just around your big event or fundraising campaign. So do remember this as we continue um, to chat today. Exactly. And I do just want to note that um, community brands did a study and we are seeing that donors typically give four to 10 times per year to the organizations that they support. So that's really important to keep in mind is this all year round giving, your donors are going to give multiple times throughout the year. So it's nice to have these, um, these different campaigns, different events, um, anything to kind of bring your donors together. 
Yeah, definitely. So um, that previous statistic of the four to 10 times a year was before COVID time. So we might see a little bit of a shift and we already are kind of seeing one that um, the average donor participation rate since um, COVID-19 has started in campaigns has actually increased um, up to 31% in the past two months compared to 8% earlier in the year. So we are seeing some of the donors, you know, they're kind of, act, they're being more active, they're being more engaged, um, and it's a great time to take advantage of that. So just because we feel like the world is kind of on hold doesn't mean that your organization and your mission is on hold. Um, just very few organizations right now can afford to hold off on fundraising until we can gather in these large groups again. So whatever your mission, your, your donors do need to stay open. Um, another thing to remember as your continuing engagement is to hold the people that you know accountable. So your board, your organization's team, your really dedicated volunteers, um, they're definitely your biggest advocates. So you should always be thinking of ways to optimize them, um, which we will get into a little bit later. But you also wanna stay active, whether it's with campaigns, whether it's on social media, whether it's an email, text, phone communication, um, but really do try different things so you can, you can reach as many people as possible. And so, to add on to what Megan said, which is all absolutely yeah. true, as you're trying yeah. all of these different things, make sure that you're tracking and thinking about what's working and what's not. You'll know your donors better than anyone, and you'll know what's working for them and how they're responding. So we always encourage people to make a plan, which helps to avoid a sort of lull or you feel like you fell off the map because you haven't done something in a while and you have to scramble to get it together. So a really nice plan for the year or the month or right now even the week can be really helpful to make sure that your communication stays strong. Um, most of the social and communication tools today that you might find will allow you to schedule posts and emails. So definitely take advantage of that so you don't feel like you're doing everything on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, those are all really great points. And just to kind of rolling into, into that and to dig a deep um, a little bit further, uh, the best practices around calling, texting, and emailing your, your donors. Over to you, Megan. Yeah, I can definitely talk about this. Um, one big thing to think about is length. So when you're thinking about the type of communication you want to have with your donors, uh, you think of email or you think social media posts. Um, with emails especially, you want to be kind of concise. You can certainly think of how many different companies and organizations, retailers have been emailing you since the pandemic has started. And you just think of how many emails you're getting on a regular basis. Um, it's good to think about what catches your own eye and, you know, which emails do you open, which emails do you skim really quickly, which ones do you delete automatically, and then which ones do you actually take the time to read through. Um, we think that a good rule of thumb here is to think about your own attention span, what kind of lures you in, and then what will actually um, kind of get your attention and even better make you complete some sort of action, whether it's a donation, whether it's clicking the link. Um, and this is something that you can really kind of take and put into your own organization and your own email. So those things that you think are really nice to see in emails, you can put into your own and we can really see that lead kind of donors into action because you're taking the time to think about what might, might be enticing them, what might be educating them more. Um, in email subject lines, you definitely wanna aim for 60 characters or less. This way when someone's reading your email on their phone, your subject line is sure to fit and it's not gonna get cut off. And kind of make all the points that you need um, and kind of while we lean towards shortness in today's world of constant communication remember that emotion um, and really connecting is your objective um, you really want to think about the goal of this communication you want um, your really big mission your important mission to be really clear to your donors but you don't want to oversimplify it in this communication you want people um, to know exactly what you're doing and you deserve to take the time to tell them. And so making sure that you're being really clear and concise in this communication is going to be overall really helpful. Um, yeah, and so when you think about these email tactics and even in your social media posts, you might make a longer Facebook post than you would an Instagram post. Um, you do want to start to measure these. So whatever tool you're managing, you're using to manage your emails, um, they should have some sort of reporting available. And then all social media platforms too, you can see different likes, 
see different comments, engagement. Um, this way you can see what's actually working for you and then also for your audience. So if you're new to reporting, maybe consider looking at the time of day that you're sending it, um, send emails in the morning one week and then maybe the next week send it in the afternoon and see which ones do better. Um, and then look at the reporting and this will actually tell you what people are reading. So what we typically see with nonprofit emails is the benchmarks are somewhere around for open rates, we say like 25% or more. Um, and when they have those open rates, what's the subject line when they open it? So, and then also click through rates. Click through rates we usually see are 2.6%. So links do they click, which ones are they actually interested in? So oh, Megan, I just want to jump in with a quick question. Um, and so mm -hmm. you're saying basically that they, everyone should aim for open rates of 25% and click through rates of 2.6. Those are, those are considered like good and, and successful, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. exactly. And yeah, it's just what we've seen be successful. Of course, you're going to have some variance, especially if you're starting just to ramp up your email communication. You don't want to be kind of intimidated by those numbers. It's just a good mm -hmm. benchmark to kind of go by. Yeah, and rep reporting definitely can be daunting, but that seems like a really great um, place to start. And so, Emily, over to you kind of on a more more conventional phone calls, like should organizations still be calling um, their donors today? Yes, 100% without hesitation. Um, we actually at Giving Tree started out in figuring out this whole pandemic situation with our blanket recommendation to every organization is absolutely you should be calling all of your donors. And we're now seeing kind of the fruits of that work. And we're actually seeing organizations that are now in their second round of personal outreach and phone calls, which I'll talk a little bit about. And it's really worth it. Um, just to give you a, a preview, we had an organization that did personal phone calls. They were converting their work from in person to telehealth. They're a mental health organization. And a donor out of the blue said, thank you so much for checking in. I'm so happy to hear about the work that you've been doing. Here's a six figure gift that I wasn't gonna give otherwise. So if you needed oh, proof wow. that phone calls are worth it, that to me is absolutely the shining example because that was not something that they had expected to come in. So if you're sitting there thinking I'm really short staffed, how am I ever gonna do that? I would say there are definitely people on your team, whether it's your staff or your board or your volunteers that absolutely should be helping you with this type of outreach. So put a board meeting together, whether it's on Zoom or on the phone and have your board members sit down in front of a donor list, divvy it up, have each of them take a number of people so that you can do that personal phone call outreach and Next thing you know, everyone in your database will get a personal phone call, whether it's donors or members. If you're a membership-based organization, anyone in your system should definitely be hearing from you on an intentional, personal basis. And we feel like that's absolutely valued and worthwhile. Um, I think one yeah. of the really important pieces that can sometimes get overlooked is, okay, I'm gonna do personal outreach, it seems so simple, but my board members aren't doing it. And my volunteers have a whole list that they volunteered to take off of my hands and they're just not doing it. And they're not starting because they don't know where to start. So I would say as a nonprofit professional, it is your job to have talking points that they can fall back on and know how to start the conversation. What are a couple of messages that you absolutely want them to say? to the donors and what are some of the things that they shouldn't be sharing that maybe they know because they're deeply involved, but you don't need getting out to the whole community. Um, frequently asked questions is something that they should be equipped with for these types of conversations. And of course, an air of, I wanna check in and see how these people are doing and really be able to listen. So all of those are important tools in this moment. And the last thing I'll add is that these calls absolutely benefit your donors and they wanna know you care about them, but it also benefits you because chances are one of your board members or volunteers is gonna call you up after they have a call and say, you know, so-and-so actually told me they're doing okay and I think that we can ask them for their annual gift and I think they would give it. And I think they're in a really nice position where they're not struggling right now and they have things under control and they wanna support us. So that's awesome data for you to have on hand and to just kind of check in and see where people are doing. Yeah, that, those are all really good points because I feel like you could have your own, I mean, I'm sure there are probably coaching sessions just even involved, you know, with, with the phone calls because as a volunteer, you might be nervous to call 
some, you might be nervous to call someone, um, you know, if I think about myself personally, if I'm a volunteer and I'm calling, it's like, oh, well, what do they, what do I do if they ask me X, Y, and Z? Um, but do you usually recommend, like if you're, let's say a volunteer doesn't know exactly how to answer a question, um, do you usually set them up with a plan of like, oh, you know, you can contact so-and-so at the organization or what do you guys recommend for that? Yeah, exactly. So I like to have, like I said, a list of frequently asked questions available to whoever's making mm -hmm. the phone call so that they feel comfortable that nothing's going to come out of the blue. And I also often will tell people something always comes out of the blue. There will always be a question you don't know the answer to, and you should not mm -hmm. make anything up. And the best thing you can do is say, you know, I'm going to ask my team about that. Can I follow up with you? They will say yes. And if you actually follow up with them, they will be thrilled. And that's just another feather in your cap. So I would definitely encourage you to do that. Yeah. Cool. Great. Thank you for, for those phone those phone insights. And so Megan, what about texting? Do we think that texting is a good move? Yes or no? Or what do you recommend there? Yeah, I definitely recommend texting. I do think you want to text with some intention. It may not be for everyone. So maybe if you know that you have some of your older donors that wouldn't respond as well to a text message as they would to a personal phone call, obviously take that into consideration. But I think since everyone's getting emails from really anyone and everyone right now, um, it's a great way to differentiate. So you can see the text messages here. It's a screenshot um, that shows two different texts, but it's sent with the Give Smart text function. So you can send the links directly through your campaign. and you can nudge your donors to either donate directly, you can ask them to get more involved with social media, you can just send a text checking in. Um, it won't lead to the phone conversation, but it is a little bit easier and still adds a really nice personal touch because you're typing up the message, sending it directly to their phone. Of course, we're all checking our phones right now. Um, so it'll be really good to you know, get some visibility. Um, and we actually do see yeah. a 98% open rate with the text messages. So there's a lot of success with that, which is, which is really great. Cool. So moving right along. So now in the next section with creatively, um, you know, Megan, what should organizations be doing to stand out, not only among their peers, um, but their specific campaigns in this time? Yeah, definitely. So we, we definitely know it's important that the mission stands out from the crowd, especially right now with everything that we've just been talking about. Um, at GiveSmart, we've actually seen a lot of our clients push their fundraising events or campaigns back to the fall, especially if it was supposed to happen within the last few months, if it was maybe happening over the summer. So while this is completely understandable, of course, if you're supposed to be having a big fundraising event, we can't do that. Let's push it back to the fall. Let's push it to next spring. Um, there are a few things to consider with different online campaigns and potential funding cuts, maybe some pulled sponsorships just from the state of things right now, there's an even more competitive edge for donor dollars and attention within the next coming months. So we've seen a lot of success um, with our clients and then also me personally working with Hearts of Gold directly, which as Kelsey mentioned before, I'm the co-chair of the associate committee. So I work directly with um, their small core team um, and it's a nonprofit based in New York City that helps women and children who are in homeless shelters in the area. So this is actually an example of our co-founder, our founder and CEO, um, Deborah. She posts a lot to her own social media account. And so her personal account has her own network of people that she's, you know, just worked with and known in the past, you know, few decades that she's been working. And um, then Hearts and Gold will actually repost her own personal post to the organization's page. Um, so the personal aspect, which we saw in that survey that we did in the beginning, that's really important right now, those personal touches. So um, it could be for you, for your team, your president, your board, your volunteers, your honorees, big donors, really anyone who's um, engaged with your organization and likely understands um, how important this time is for you, they can really share their personal connection with the organization on their own social media account. Um, and what Deb is doing on this post is she's actually letting people know that any donations that they give right now, um, starting with a $40 donation, it goes towards a, um, a care package that she puts together directly. She's still working um, right now to put together care packages for the moms and the kids in the homeless shelters. 
And so she's really connecting people to make sure that they know exactly what their money is going towards right now. Um, and then one thing that we did too that you'll see on the next slide is we actually put together templates to post to Instagram stories that showcases and thanks our family and friends who've donated. This is actually from my own personal account. Um, the associate committee put together a campaign to raise money directly for those care packages and then also for meals that we can give um, to the women and the children in the shelters. And then I would post a thank you message on my Instagram story of whoever of my friends or family or network that yeah, donated directly I, to the cause. I love this. Thank you. And I, I yeah, like it's that really it's, fun. You know, Mm -hmm. And Instagram being so interactive that you just, if you, whoever's flipping through your story can see, okay, you know, this is what $20 gets me, this is what $40 not gets me, but um, provides, you know, is, is what your, where their donation goes, um, and then as well as the 40 exactly. exactly. It's a really great idea. Yeah. And we really wanted people to understand exactly where the money was going. Um, and then, mm -hmm. too, if people are tagged in something, then they're a lot more likely to repost it, which that goes with Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, tagging people, they'll send it out to their own networks because people love the sort of recognition and the community building of that. Um, yeah, and that repost another, is like, that's the easiest way to post something. Mm -hmm. If you're tagged, you just boop, repost, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, another thing that can be leveraged with social is potential partnerships. So it's great to get publicity across um, social networks that, really help to double your exposure because if you can have this sort of partnership, if it's a business in your community, if it's a nonprofit where you don't have quite the same mission, but maybe they line up, you can work together and then post to your different audiences. So you're getting, like I said, double the exposure. Um, one thing that Hearts of Gold did was they found a grant opportunity with a beauty company called Shea Moisture. Um, and then Shea Moisture hosted their own Instagram Live with the recipients of the grant. So it was a really great way to get awareness specifically for Hearts of Gold mission. Um, and so in that Instagram live, Deborah went on and talked about everything that they were doing together um, and everything she was doing to help the moms and the kids um, that she directly, that directly benefit from the mission. So like I said, finding someone in your community that kind of complements your mission and reaching out to them, I feel like people are very open to sort of partnerships right now. Um, and you can see another example in the post right next to it of, just even a group of different organizations that came together to try to raise money for a great cause. Um, another thing yeah. that you can do, oh, Kelsey, go ahead. Oh, no, that, that's okay. I was just going to, um, I was just going to say that, yeah, thinking about organizations that, that complement your mission seem, seem to make, make sense. And like you said, a lot of people are open to it and we are seeing that a lot at, at Gibsmart as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another um, another thing you can consider is doing some sort of game. I know most of you might be familiar with this when you think about in-person fundraising events, but there is a way that you can transition this to virtual. So you can do something like a wine pool where someone, you know, gets their wine, um, pays for their wine online, and then you ship it directly to them. Um, different things like raffles, that can all be digital. If it's a 50-50 raffle, they're winning something, or it's a basket raffle. You can also do something like a voting opportunity. You can do a sign-up party or different mystery boxes. So there are certainly ways that you can stand out a little bit where it's not just asking for a donation, but getting, getting your donors to be a little bit more involved and um, kind of give money that way. Yeah, for sure. And so, Emily, I, I just want to turn to you to see, and you're going to chat about video a little bit, but do you have anything else that, that you want to add in terms of what organizations should be doing to creatively uh, stand out right now? I think Megan is spot on. And the other thing I would add to this um, information about the games is actually anything that you do in person at, like, let's say, your annual gala. Oftentimes, there's a way to translate it very creatively to right now in a remote setting. Um, so I actually had heard about a local day school here in Chicago that typically has an opportunity to buy wine at your table when you arrive. So that's like an upcharge. They get all these fancy bottles of wine donated. And like Megan was saying, they instead right now are doing a virtual gala and they're shipping the wine. To your house so not only are people still able to do that but now not your whole your whole table is not all at your house for this event 
So you actually have more people buying the wine and increasing your revenue. So I would encourage everyone to really think creatively about what can be translated and how that might be able to really up your revenue in this setting. Yeah, definitely. Um, so turning to video, um, as a Chicago native, of course, we're all paying very close attention to our aquarium here in town, has been doing a lot of videos about the penguins who they are letting roam around, and that has gotten a lot of attention. I hope that many of you have been able to check that out. Um, so we are seeing a lot of museums utilize video, botanical gardens, aquariums. Uh, there's really been a ton of creativity on the video front, which I think is awesome, because I know when I'm just scrolling, that makes me stop and and laugh and smile and really want to be engaged. And I actually know um, a colleague who works at the Shutter Aquarium here in Chicago who said that their gifts have almost tripled because of the traction that those videos have been getting. So it is fun and engaging for your brand and it also can have a large impact on your revenue, which I think is amazing as a fundraising professional. So um, we love to see things like that. I also work with an organization here on the west side of Chicago called College Mentoring Experience, and they work to provide mentoring opportunities to underprivileged youth in their community with the goal of getting them to attend and graduate from college. They're pretty phenomenal. And as you can imagine with an organization like that, there are a ton of constituent groups. There's mentors, there's mentees, there's donors, there's parents of students who are in their programs. And so I was working with their founder and he wanted to make sure that everyone knew that they were there. And the only way to do that is face to face. They really emphasize being together as a group and having that type of communication. So they developed a series of, I would say town hall style video meetings, virtual hangouts, round tables, um, for each of those groups individually and broke it down in some of the groups I mentioned and then even a little further where they had middle school students just be together so they could have a really great honest conversation. High school students, college students, they really broke it down so that it was relevant and engaging for all of their constituents um, and they saw really nice results from that and from that launched an an online social media campaign where they have different people in their community sending in a really simple selfie video that you could take right now in two seconds just saying i'm emily here's how i'm getting through this time and i'm thinking about you and this has so far been their most engaging social media campaign to date and they've seen a lot of traction for their brand and have gotten their name out there a lot more than they would have had they not taken advantage of this opportunity so i think video both on an internal and external basis can make a huge difference in your messaging right now. Yeah, totally. Well, these are all really brilliant ways to make the most of, you know, things that you might already be doing on social or email. So thank you both so much for, for all of those insights. And so um, the last section we're just going to run through is balancing communications among your different donor groups. So Emily, could you kind of break this down for us? Yeah. So we talk about donor groups in a couple of different ways. So just to kind of clarify what we're going to talk through right now is the difference between a monthly, an annual, a first time donor and a major donor, your bigger sponsors to your organization. Your team likely has a more nuanced breakdown, which is great because every organization operates a little bit differently. So you can apply this to however your we call it the giving period pyramid, however that looks for your organizations. If you're broad based people on the bottom and increasing levels as you get closer to the top, while there's less people at the top, they account for a large chunk of your revenue. So we like to think about it that way. Um, before I jump into each level, I think one thing that's really important right now is to remember that you have to update your case for support. So you likely have what we in at Giving Tree call a case for support. That's why someone would give to your organization. It's the data you have on hand. It's the messaging that you typically use, those talking points that your team is equipped to share with a donor. That's your case for support. But right now, you probably have had to alter your programming. You potentially had to pivot. You maybe have increased your services. Your case for giving looks a lot differently than it did a couple of months ago. So we want to make sure that you're prepared to tell donors how you're responding to this crisis. We really want to know that. Make it clear that you have a plan so that you're building that trust and make sure that you're ready to tell them how they can help because a lot of them will ask you that. So to start with your monthly donors, 
one of the biggest mistakes that I see when I work with organizations that have a robust monthly giving program is that they don't consider them to be part of their significant donor base and rather just send them a text letter at the end of the year with a thank you note and that's kind of it. If that's you, not to worry, we're gonna fix that right now because I don't think that's gonna apply anymore. Um, donors today really wanna know what's going on and they wanna feel engaged with your organization. And the reality is these people are critical to your organization because they provide a really secure revenue stream that you know you can count on every month and you can predict throughout the year what's gonna come in for your budget because of these people. So I wanna make sure that we're all prepared to tell them just how valued they are. Sometimes your monthly donors are giving at a similar level who, as someone who just makes a major gift at the end of every calendar year. So they should receive the same level of stewardship and communication. So I would say first and foremost, get to know them. Use a personal phone call, just chat, get to know who they are. Why are they supporting you on a regular basis if you don't already know the answer to that? And if you do and you have a relationship, make that same call that you would to the person that gives you a couple thousand dollars at the end of every year. Make sure that they're in your regular rotation. And when you're writing to this group, um, either in email or in a direct mail piece, using language like your continued support to make it clear that you know that they are giving to you on a regular basis is really important so that that's always acknowledged. Um, if possible, I think Megan already mentioned this earlier, but tying a dollar amount to a program or service offering really helps to paint a picture of your impact. So if someone's giving you $10 a month, what does that allow you to do every month? Or what does that allow you to do at the end of the year because of that gift? I think that's awesome and people really respond to that. Um, and yeah, I think that that's, I, oh, sorry, I just wanted to say that I think that that is a good point, and that sounds like something, something as simple as, okay, here's what $40 gives us, you know, that seems like that could be an easy enough touch point, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think the tricky part, and I'm happy to talk about this offline if anyone is concerned about this, but you want to be very clear that your language in those types of communications is not indicating that something is a restricted gift. So you don't want to say this $40 is going to fund this program because you want to have the flexibility to do that or to allocate it wherever you need to. Um, so if someone's a little bit confused about that or wants to talk more, I'm happy to, to run through that together. Um, but the last piece okay, I want to make yeah. monthly, monthly giving is I spoke to a, a colleague of mine who came from a large scale nonprofit organization. And I was asking her about monthly giving and she said, you know what, the only times in my career I've been surprised when I've heard that someone left us a planned gift in their estate is when it was a monthly donor who was only giving a little bit of, of money. So this happened multiple times throughout her career where someone had been giving like five, ten dollars a month, but very regularly, or maybe a really small annual gift that has been coming for years and years and years. You don't really know that person. All of a sudden they left this estate gift to the organization. That to me was like such an amazing story. I think it's very eye-opening to a lot of the work that we do that we need to remember that people might feel more connected than you thought they were. And to send this group of donors information about planned giving might be a great idea. Maybe that's something to include at this moment, but to have in your back pocket of if this is a target group that might be interested in that, definitely get that information to them as one of your couple of touch points throughout the year. Yeah, those are all really, really amazing points. Um, and definitely a group that should not be left out, I would say. Um, and so how about annual, annual donors? Yeah, so these are the people who are giving regularly to your annual campaign. Maybe it's the same amount, maybe it's a little bit increased year over year. Um, one of the things that I think is tricky right now is that it's so important to not assume anything. We don't know if someone lost their job. We don't know if people are struggling, but we also don't know if they're okay and if things are going just fine. And this is true with all donors, but I think especially those annual donors at kind of a mid-range level that you might not know their financial situation or their family situation, this can be especially true. So you just never know. And I think it's really important not to be afraid to ask in a time like this. So I've seen a lot of language coming in communications, something along the lines of, if you're in a position to support us. And I think that's totally okay to say, but I also wanna very explicitly give you permission that you don't have to say that. You need support, 
you don't have to apologize for that. People know you're a nonprofit organization and they know you have a budget to make and people to serve. And if you've updated your case for support and it's clear about what you need, people are not going to be offended by you asking for a gift. I think it is more impactful to share exactly what you're doing, how you have pivoted, explain this isn't business as usual, and your donors might feel even more valued because whatever gift they made last year, they can increase it by just $10. That impact goes that much further right now in the face of such a, a pandemic situation that we haven't seen in our lifetime. Yeah, Emily, I just I just want to ask a question about that because, you know, you say, I think that a thing that we're hearing from a lot of people, um, from, from customers and on webinars is how do I, given the current circumstances of the pandemic, you know, they feel a bit uncomfortable being so confident in their act, um, you know, sort of something like, we don't know people's financial situation at, at the moment. So they, they feel afraid to ask, but what would you, what would you say to those people who are asking those sorts of questions in this time? Yeah, I think this comes up all the time. And again, you, all of these organizations know their donors best. So what I would say is you should not be afraid to ask. And it's important not to be over asking right now. You do not have to be asking on every platform and you don't need to be asking weekly the way you might in a normal situation, kind of include a donate button here and there. I think your asks need to be very intentional and you need to be very clear about why the funding is even more important and what it is going to support and how your organization has stepped up and pivoted in this moment. I think if you do all of those things, people will not be offended by you trying to keep your lights on and trying to keep your staff in place. These are realities of the world that we're living in right now. And donors, like I said, want to feel really valued. And if you are able to mm -hmm. take your $300 gift from last year and make it $350 this year, that $50 means so much more right now than it ever could. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, well, thank you. And so moving on, Megan, Megan what about first-time donors? Yeah, so first-time donors are obviously people who have yet to support your mission. So you do have to educate them so that way they know why they're getting involved, why they're starting to donate. Um, we've given the example multiple times. Hearts of Gold, we made it clear that $20 gives you this, $40 gives you this, um, just to kind of give them an idea of exactly what their donations are going towards. Um, it's also especially helpful to make sure that you have sort of an elevator pitch of your organization and you include it when you're posting on social media. So if anyone runs across that post um, or gets an email for the first time, they really clearly know exactly what your mission is. Um, and we've seen a lot of success. Obviously, the name Hearts of Gold doesn't exactly share what the organization is doing. So we've really tried to put a lot of emphasis on that for whenever we have someone who might be seeing our information for the very first time. Cool. Um, Emily, do you have and anything that you want to add about first-time donors? Yeah, I was going to say the good news about that is that according to a recent report that I was reading this morning from Fidelity Charitable, 25% of donors are actually planning to increase their giving in response to this pandemic, and 54% of donors are planning to maintain their current giving. So people are not going away, and there really even is a group of people that want to increase their gifts and are looking for places to support because they are able to. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, that is that is great news to hear. Um, this, you know, any good news is is some good news. So, um, OK, yeah, your first moving on. Are out there. Yeah, they are um, amazing. And so I just want to wrap up with a few takeaways. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm eager to get to those. Um, the last three takeaways that we just want to leave you all with um, are, are being texting with intention so that every touch and every communication um, is heard and, and you know same can go for email and, and phone as well. Utilize your biggest advocates, so your staff, founders, president, the board, volunteers, um, big donors, even small donors who maybe interact with you a ton on social, um, utilize those people and get them to keep spreading spreading your message and sharing with their networks and also to measure. So look at what you are doing in order to measure, you know, connecting with your donors, measure what you're doing, see what they're reading, see what they're opening, see what's catching their eye. Um, and ultimately that will help make your connections even more meaningful um, and even more effective. 
And so um, before we wrap up, like I said, we have a lot of questions. And so, all right, let's get into those. So the first question that we have, blocking my view. Um, okay, so question for Megan. With text messaging, how do you ask them to opt in or is this just a or is this just a blast without giving them the option? So in the situation we showed, um, that was specifically from GiveSmart, so they would have had to register for the campaign in order to have their cell phone number included, unless you already have that information included um, when you're getting information from donors, you can then upload it into the site and actually send them a text message. Um, but typically when they're filling out that registration information, um, they do. They are opting in for those messages, and then we do have an opt-out option, um, which they'll also see when they receive that first text message. So it does give people a chance, you know, you're not going to be blasting them with messages and they won't ever have a chance to end it. Um, so they do have some sort of say with that. Cool. Okay, and so the next question is for Emily. How do you make calls from home without a work caller ID? And what would the con conversation look like over the phone? Do you leave a voicemail or follow a script? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I think it's a nice question about if you are comfortable calling from home or not. I see most organizations where people are comfortable using their cell phones. If not, I do believe there's a way to block your number from coming through if you're not comfortable with someone um, having your personal phone number. I, I know that people don't really pick up the phone if they don't know who's calling these days because you just never know who's calling. Um, so I would definitely leave a voicemail. I think it's simple enough to just say, I'm Emily, I'm calling from this organization. I wanted to check in with you. If you're comfortable giving me a call back, I would love to, to see how it's going. I think that's really all you have to say since oftentimes those phone calls yeah. are not solicitation so I don't think you're hiding anything just by saying I wanted to check in and see how it's going um, and to address the piece about um, a script yeah was that the second part yes it was yeah so to address that piece so like I said with the talking points I I often if I'm formatting them will do it in somewhat of a script format where someone can kind of follow the logic like you're checking in and things seem okay here's what you can talk about. You're checking in and things are not that great. Here are some resources you can share. So I like to try to offer a number of different options. And then I think it's totally fair to include a voicemail script or a couple of bullet points on here's what happens if you got a voicemail. And I also think you can prepare your team to, to just say what I shared earlier. Like I'm just calling to check in and see how you're doing. Cool. Um, I have another question for you, Emily, um, about phone calls. Mm -hmm. So you said there yeah. should be more than one phone call. How much time between these rounds of calls um, do you, so how much time between the rounds of calls so that it doesn't seem like we are annoying our donors? So again, I think you probably know your donors best and will be able to assess if what I'm saying is relevant to your organization or not. If you are an organization that is not doing a lot of personal outreach and that is historically not your jam, that's okay. And that, in that case, I think one round of phone calls now is totally fine. And then you can let it simmer and give it some time. I work with a bunch of organizations that are used to being like all over their people all the time. And it wouldn't be strange to get a call every two weeks from someone checking in because that's the type of board that they have. And that's how hands-on they are. And that's how small they are too. You know, if you have a list of thousands and thousands of people, you're not going to call them every other week. That's not realistic. So I think you have to have a priority list. We say like your top 10 to 20 people that you are in touch with regularly. These are people who you need to give updates to, who you can bring into strategy conversations, who really are engaged and involved and hopefully supporting you at a high level. Those are the people to be checking in with very regularly. And I would say every two to three weeks is appropriate for that. And then I think there's another tier of people that it does not have to be that frequent. Um, it just has to be intentional. And if you feel like once a month or once every six weeks or once every two months is appropriate and people are going to be okay with that, then do what's best for your people. Okay. Um, the next one is for Megan. Um, we have a newsletter that is very long, but we'd like to email it. If it's very long and clunky and our patrons are in the boomer generation, what might you recommend? 
Yeah, I I definitely think there is a way to get that. So it's kind of clear you can use really great email template tools depending on, I don't know if you use something like, um, I know MailChimp is one that offers great templates. What you can also do is there are free design tools such as Canva, um, just C-A-N-Z-A dot com, which is free. And you can actually design something to kind of lay out all of the things that you put in your newsletter. Um, you do want to test these emails when you send them out, see what they look like whenever you're sending them when you look, you know, look at your phone versus on the computer um, and make sure to put the most important information first. So that way, if someone doesn't get through the whole newsletter, you at least know that they're seeing the most important ones at the top. Um, but yeah, make sure to make it clear with headings, kind of just section it out so that way it's really easy to look at and really easy to consume. Um, you can also have it hosted on your website and maybe you put a teaser of the newsletter within the email and then encourage people to click, click directly through to the website. And you can do the same on your social media. You can, um, you can post just little tidbits of the information to try to drive people to your website directly um, to really get people more engaged in that content. Great. Um, there is a question that came through about how do you do wine pulls and raffles when online sales are prohibited in many states? And I think the quick statement for, for a reply on that is if you're going to do a wine pull or a raffle, please just check your state laws as it does vary from state to state um, in terms of what you can do with those games of chance and as well as alcohol sales online. Um, so here's a question for Emily. When it comes to corporate cause marketing type partnerships, do you have any recommendations for initiating these kinds of conversations? We've had many companies approach us for partnerships, but we have yet to think of partners that have strong alignment and we have yet to reach out to them for partnerships. Let me know if you need me oh, to repeat that. Based, based on this question, I'm guessing that these are people who are looking to partner now for the first time. Is that fair to assume, Kelsey? Yes, I think it is fair to, to assume, um, and they are um, have yet to kind of find someone that has aligned with them. Got it. Okay, so I think now is the time for sure to be very true to your mission. And if you have that gut feeling that someone doesn't align with your organization, then I would stay true to that. I know it's really tricky to not accept a gift right now or a funding that people are trying to hand you. Um, it's really scary when you're looking at potentially not meeting your goals for the year. Um, but I will say that staying true to your mission and and really just knowing what your case is and what you are trying to do is the best thing that you can do to build your brand long term. Um, and I am hopeful that it will all the funding will bounce back when the time comes. Uh, I will say if you are trying to initiate partnerships right now, I can speak to the foundation side of things that we've had conversations on the Giving Tree team with some clients who work at foundations or other grant makers. And there are a lot of organizations that were not prior to prior giving to more widespread or had a very small mission that they were giving to and supporting from a grant making perspective that now are doing relief funding. So an example of that is here in Chicago, there's an organization called Chicago Beyond that's really involved in the education space. And they have since launched a COVID-19 relief funding opportunity for organizations that they wouldn't usually support. So there are a lot of opportunities out there for additional funding. And I would say, even if you think you know what an organization typically gives to and you're looking for those types of larger grants at the moment, um, definitely don't, don't rule anything out and look into see if they have pivoted in this time, just like the rest of us. Great. Um, okay, so the next question is for either Megan or Emily. How can we encourage staff to take videos? I assume this probably means personal videos. Yeah, I can jump oh, in I, here. Yeah, go ahead. So I would say maybe starting with doing a video yourself to kind of set the stage of what you're kind of expecting, especially if you want people to know that it's going to be something more casual or more informal, um, is maybe doing the video yourself, putting out whatever kind of standard you want to have, and then encouraging people to do it. Um, but really setting the stage, like I said, is going to be the best way to encourage people as soon as more, and then maybe tag 
one or two of the closer people in your organization to also film a video, once people start to do it, it'll kind of catch on and it'll feel a little bit more the norm because as we know, we're all kind of in our comfy clothes, we're in our pajamas during the day working from home. So it is, it is good to be a little bit more casual um, in this sort of stage. Hey, do you, Emily, do you have anything you want to add to that? The only thing I would, add is, I would add is that I think you have to make it as easy as possible for people. So if it's easier for someone to take a video on their phone and just text it to you, make that option available, even if you don't usually text with your coworkers. Or if what you need to do is a no makeup selfie contest, to do that. If you want to do like a pajama party video because you don't want people to have to feel like they need to get dressed, do things like that. Just make it very low barrier to entry so that you can get as much participation as you need. Yeah, great. Um, so this question is for Megan. What are your thoughts on dropping off gifts to donors right now? More like a delivery um, rather than expecting a visit. Permission-based, of course, after calling them. Yeah, I I think it's great that you're even considering doing that. I know it, it is a little bit concerning. I think make the gift something that can sit for a few days. I think it's a really, really nice touch. Um, people are still ordering things and um, getting things shipped to their house, still going grocery shopping. So I think if you want to find some sort of gift that you can provide to these donors, either it's something you send through the mail or something that you deliver to them. I think as long as you're following whatever protocol sh you should be following and then dropping it off, making sure that they know that they have a gift, that they can wait a few days to open it. I think it is a really nice personal touch. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, people are trying to do what they can with social distancing. So even just doing a drive-by and kind of waving out the window um, and seeing your donors, maybe just having a conversation from far away, that could also be a really nice touch as well. Great. Um, so Emily, how can you use specific language in your ask while still leaving money unallocated? Yeah, so this is a question that comes up all the time. So when we work with organizations that are interested in doing like a tiered giving opportunity or you want to have at a gala that I ran last year, we had different giving levels up during the paddle raise that showed what each level supports. So you want to stay away from language that says $40 will go to this program. $50 will go to support this opportunity. That type of restrictive language could make it fuzzy so that the donor follows up and says, hey, my, my $200 lets me the kid that it supported to send to school this year. Um, so you really want to stay away from restricting yourself in that way. So we like to say things like um, $50 goes towards supporting a program like Name Your Program. We want to keep it a little bit more open so that people get the, get the picture of what you're trying to paint and yet are not locked into that specific opportunity. Okay, great. And so just our last question before we wrap up today. Um, Megan, do you think it is appropriate to thank a certain type slash level of donors with a personal video of the personal video of border staff saying thank you? I think that's great. I think if you have people who are, like we mentioned, your bigger donors, your annual donors, the ones who have really, you know, gotten more engaged and more involved with your organization, it is a really nice personal touch for them to receive something like a like a video. Um, it, it's great to just segment if you're going to email it out to them, you know, segment that list, make sure you're sending it to those specific donors, um, make it feel kind of more personal. And so that way, you know, you're sending it directly to them, they're receiving that video. But I do think we're lacking that sort of interaction right now. So it's really nice. Video is a really great tool to use to make sure that you're still getting that sort of interaction. Um, and people do kind of feel like they're seen with making sure that they're still supporting your organization and you're also appreciating it. So that, that's a really nice touch. Great, okay, actually we do have one more question, sorry, that we're gonna squeeze in for Emily. Um, and this is, should we call a donor a part of our family in any sort of communications and is this appropriate? That's a really interesting question. I think that you should do that if it's part of your brand and if it's something that you're comfortable with already and would have done a couple of months ago. If that's not, 
how your organization is and typically operates and how you communicate, then I think saying friends is fine. I think saying community is fine. I think there are a lot of ways to say that without pushing that boundary if it Mm -hmm. makes you feel uncomfy. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much, you two. And um, for everyone who submitted questions, also thank you. We will round up the rest of them and we'll get back to you directly um, because I know we didn't have a chance to get to all of them. And tomorrow we have our final webinar of our nonprofit Pivot Success Series where we're going to talk about how um, one organization more than tripled their goals and they will continue to run virtual fundraisers here on out, they said. And then in our Ju- uh, in June, our Outside the Room series will kick off. And so most of you have already pivoted or you've postponed your event. So this next series is going to be about what now and, and how do we kind of continue to go forward from here. So this is going to be with more of a focus on bridging the gap and raising more. So details and registration will be in a follow-up email this evening in case you're interested. Um, and if you would like a complimentary coaching session with Giving Tree Associates, um, please see the link in the chat to sign up for your 30-minute time slot. Huge thanks again to Emily and Megan for joining us today. And thank you to everyone who, um, who took the time to listen and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you.